inspirational man to hear his testimony, his marriage, what he went through. And you know, we have, we have a common denominator, um, Bet and I do, which is our next speaker, Richard Bright. Um, he impacted Bet's life to be here. He impacted my life to be here because he was, he was at Lakeshore. Him and his wife were at a marriage conference there. And I tell this every time he speaks because it's just so funny now. <laughs> then it wasn't too funny, but now he was speaking on pornography and he's very open about it. And at the time, Lakeshore was not that keen on sp- speaking about pornography in front of everybody. But he was very open about it. And my wife is like, oh, I'm going to go talk to him. I said, no, you're not. And he said, now this, granted, this, this is right after I was exposed, right? I said, you're going to sit right here. <laughs> you're not going anywhere. Well, after they got done speaking, there she goes up to talk to Richard. I'm like, oh, great. So I'm sitting in the back, and they're talking, and they're looking back at me. And I'm doing one of these numbers. And finally I get up. I go up to him. I'm like, all right, here's the deal. Told him everything. Everything about my past, what had just happened, my addiction. He kind of looked at me. He was like, man, she didn't tell me any of this. (laughs) So that's, but from right then, he declared freedom on our marriage from the get-go, and here he is. So, I mean, that's what I'm saying. The common denominator, that's why I'm here. One of the reasons he introduced me to Bet. Bet introduced me to Maximize Manhood, got me to an encounter. There's steps that you take, and it all revolves around a pivotal person, okay? So Richard and Sherry Bright are branded as the top and upcoming humorous marriage entertainers Richard and Sherry are being a blended family, are extremely transparent, you know what I'm saying, about their own real-life marriages, and they are fearlessly share the ups and downs of the marital bliss. The Brights, native to Texas, have called a Lakewood, I said Lakeshore last time, church in Houston for their home for 14 years. Richard and Sherry have been a vital part of Lakewood's marriage ministry and volunteer on numerous projects and committees. Richard and Sherry serve, serve under their pastor, Joel Osteen. Our lead teachers for the Marriage Rocks, this hilarious duo, duo preach and perform at churches and events across the U.S. So give it up for Richard Bright. These before. Oh, there we go. Man, I'm just a nobody telling everybody about somebody. Amen. And I'm always honored to be around a bunch of God-loving men that are making a difference in this world, right? And, you know, I was going to save this to the end. How many, how many guys have ADD? Y'all are going to love me, man. Everybody else, Jesus says, is going to be long-suffering, right? But... Um, Let's open with uh, some prayer. Father God, you're a chain breaker, Father. Like Zach Williams says, you're a way maker, Father. You will make a way where there seems like there is no way. Father, I'm asking you to break chains, Father, that have been holding these men down all of their life, Father. I'm asking for freedom, Father. I'm asking for forgiveness, Father. I'm asking to you, for you to do something different, Father, to speak a word into each one of these men here, Father, and let them know what their calling is. You have called each individual man to do something to glorify your son in heaven, Father. We just thank you for the blood of Christ, Father. We plead the blood of Jesus over everybody here, Father in their travels, Father, no matter where they came from, Father. Their, their family is blessed at home right now, Father, because they are covered in the blood of Jesus, Father. There are women that are out there right now, Father, that when these men leave and go back to their wives, Father, 
that their wives are going to say, oh, my gosh, you're a changed man. You're a godly man. You're a man that puts God first. And, man, I can follow that. And, Father, we just thank you that you have the authority. You have the ever bit authority in our life, Father. We are submitted unto you, Father, and that is how our wives submit to us is because we are under your authority. And, Father, we know that, man, when we tell our wives, submit to my authority, we've lost all authority. So, Father, we just thank you for this time. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. You know, funny story. Uh, Ronnie was talking to me about it earlier. He goes, man, how was the Grand Canyon? Right, we just got back. We took a vacation, went to the Grand Canyon, and of course, me being the outdoors kind of guy, I haven't been here in a year. Have y'all noticed anything different? Who said I look older? All right, I'm the funny one. I'm the funny one. I lost 50 pounds, right? And um, and no, I, I do not dress like this. My wife dresses me like this, right? She pulled all this out. She goes, "Wear this." I'm like, "Baby," she goes, "Just wear it." So uh, for, I'm going to keep it 100. All right. So some of you younger brothers, tell some of the older brothers what that means. All right. And when you hear that's fire, don't get up and run. Younger brothers, tell the older brothers what that means. All right. But we were at the Grand Canyon and there's some guardrails in some areas, but in a bunch of areas, there's not. So I walk up to the edge of the Grand Canyon just like this. My toes one inch from about a thousand foot drop. All right. So I turn around to my wife to get her to take a picture of me, right? And so I turn around, and she was standing right there a minute ago. Now she's running. And I'm like, girl, what are you doing? Where are you going? She goes, I got to go find a witness. And I said, for what? She goes, because if you fall, they're going to think I pushed you. <laughs> like, man, 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 man. I was talking to Bet, and I said, Bet, what do you want me to, to speak about? He goes, Richard, he goes, why don't you talk about how to have, um, to get through this time with our spouse right now and what you guys do to, to get through this, you know, unprecedented times is what everybody says, right? And I realized that God has done something in me from a long time ago. You know, we are creatures of habit, Right? And when my wife first wanted me to go to church, I didn't want to go to church because, you know, that's the way we were, we were brought up. We just didn't go to church. My mom did. She was Catholic. She went to church mass every Sunday. Uh, but my dad, at the age of 10, he tells me, son, you do what you want to do. You're a man now. And I said, well, I'll just stay home with you. And that's what I did. So he said, don't ever give your money to any preachers. Don't ever tithe. Don't ever give offerings. Don't ever do any of that. So that was, you know, that's a whole other message. But I went to church. And I felt something different, right? And I knew this is where I needed to be. And I gave my life to Christ. And as soon as that happened, it wasn't a few months after that that my wife's father got sick. And he was in the hospital rehab for a few months, and then he passed away. And then a few months after that, her mother got sick and was fighting cancer for a few, probably six or seven months. And then she got terminally ill and passed away. Then her sister got sick and was put in the hospital. And then while she was in the hospital, another sister got sick and was put in the hospital. And both of those sisters passed away. All right. Then her brother, we get a call that her brother had died from alcohol abuse and he had died and he was out in California. And all of this happened in a four year period. I'm in a blended family. I just got remarried, all right? And now our kids are coming to live with us. We have alcohol, drugs, and pornography. Or, or just constant in our life, right? And we're trying to go to church. We're trying to do the right thing. But we realized, and I started to realize, that doing these things were keeping me from God. And I didn't know how to keep that from happening, right? So we got plugged in, like Bet said, to, to the classes, and we started doing all of that. And lo and behold, we started teaching. You know, I thought I was going to be uh, the ask for volunteers, and I'm very type A, and I thought, man, this is it. I'm going to start teaching everything that I know. Well, I get there, and the first day, the, you know, the, the teacher goes, man, I go, what are we here to teach on? And he goes, actually, you're not going to teach today. He goes, do you like coffee? I said, man, I love coffee. He goes, run upstairs, grab me some coffee, get you some coffee, and make me 20 copies of this and 20 copies of this. And, you know, my wife was like, yeah, you know, and I go walking, I'm like, look, I am nobody's coffee boy, and I'm surely nobody's copy boy, right? And she goes, well, I can see that your servant heart is just overwhelming you right now, you know. 
but we stayed. And that was our story. And that was beginning our story. And we kept on. And a few years ago, our house flooded during Harvey. But now my wife and I are in a good, in a, we're in a good place. Our marriage is good. We've worked through some issues, going to classes, praying for one another, like, like Bet was saying, and working through the things that we needed to work through, all right? And once our house flooded, I know now that if we weren't in a good place, life's tragedies have a way of tearing you down, all right? But, but God, but God, you know, I don't know why our house flooded, you know. Uh, we were just in the, the middle of getting things ready. We were about to start writing a book, and then, you know, we have to do something else. we got to go live somewhere else. we got to put stuff in storage. We've got to rebuild, right? We're a month from getting back into our house, and the telephone rings at 2 o'clock in the morning, and I answer it, and it's my brother. And he goes, Sunshine died last night. That's my sister. She was 44. She was the baby of the family. She drank herself to death. Three months after that, my mom died. All right? She was 83 years old. She'd been in a nursing home for a while. Um, so we kind of we were expecting that. And then four months after that, my oldest brother died. And I don't understand any of this. But I do know one thing. God is in control of my life. And I know another thing, that he gave me a helpmate. Not only the Holy Spirit, but my wife. And I wished I would have listened to her way before I started listening to her. I thought she was trying to tell me what to do. I was being very prideful. But, man, she saw a man in me that I didn't see. And she was just trying to help me get there, even though she was doing it the wrong way. She was, you know, arguing, fighting, nagging. And I think, well, why are they nagging? You know, why is your wife nagging? Why is your girlfriend nagging? Because, man, we're not doing what God has called us to do, and they're trying to get our attention, right? So these are, this is my life, all right? But in this life and in this marriage, God used some of the humor that we were telling our story, all right? Like there was a time that I got so drunk that we'd gone out, and I went out, she went out, and I got home early, and I was going to show her, don't you go out without me. So I screwed the front door shut, right, with screws, and I unplugged the electricity so she couldn't open the garage door, and then I barricaded all the doors and windows with furniture to keep her out, right? And this is a teachable moment right here. Usually when there's ladies in the room, I, they say, man, we can't believe you did that. That is the most horrific thing we've ever heard. I would have been so mad, right? And all the guys were saying, man, did you pre-drill that door before you put those screws through it, right? <laughs> Yes, I did, but don't do that, all right? <laughs> but so this is where life started with us, volunteering, right? Just volunteering. So if you guys, like Bet was saying, get into community. We need to have community. We need to be around like-minded men and individuals that are going in the same direction, right? And um, Pastor always says this, man, if you're the smartest, most gifted, most talented person in your group, you need to find another group. Right? You need to find men that are going to make you rise to the level and the expectation of where, where God wants you to be. All right? And that's not always easy. You know, I had friends that were like, bro, come on, man. It was bros before girls. Um, <laughs> Y'all thought I was going to say it, didn't you? But I found different friends. I found godly friends. Right? And that took time right? because we want to make sure that we are in the right council. Right? Dave and Ashley Willis, very good friends of ours, you know, everybody wants to give advice, right? Everybody wants to help everybody, but here's the deal, right? They have to have these four criteria, all right? Number one, they have to love you. They have to love your spouse. They have to love God, and they have to love your marriage, right? And if one of those elements is missing, then we don't take advice from them because it's going to be skewed, okay? So just remember that. Um, I'm going to tell you about a golf story. When I first learned how to play golf, oh, my gosh, I was a hack. Man, I would get out there, and, I mean, divots everywhere. I would throw clubs. I, 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 if I broke 100, that was on the front nine, man, I was happy, right? And my friend, you know, I, I guess I was 15 years old, 16 years old. My friend goes, Richard, you got to go take a lesson from a pro. you got to go see a pro. you got to go see a pro. And, man, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to just, man, nah, I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out. So many of us are sitting in this room trying to figure it out. Got to figure it out. 
right? We're figuring it out. I went to go see a pro, and, you know, at 15, we, we grew up poor, and they wanted $75 for a lesson, and I didn't have 75 bucks. And so I told him, I said, man, I don't have that kind of money. And he goes, well, you see that old man out there? And this old man, he was all hunched over like that. I said, yeah. He goes, go talk to him. And so I, I walk out there, and I'm thinking, what can this guy teach me? You know, he can't even swing a club. You know, he's all hunched over. You know, I'm already forming my opinion of him, you know. And I walk up to him, and I said, hey, uh, Roland in the office told me to come out and talk to you because I can't afford to take a lesson from him. And he said to come speak to you. And he's, he's gathering balls, and he goes, why do you want to take a lesson? I said, so I can learn how to play better. He goes, wrong answer. I thought, well, man, that's the right answer. And he goes, no, no. The reason you want to take a lesson is because you're learning the wrong way to hold a club. You're learning the wrong way to swing. You're learning a wrong stance. And I'm going to teach you the right way to hold a club and the right way to stand and the right way to swing and address the ball. But here's the deal. You're going to get out there after I teach you this and you're going to want to revert back to your natural old way of doing things. And that just stood out to me because I thought, man, every time I got up and I would hold this club completely different than I was used to doing and take a swing, oh, my gosh, it improved my, my, my stroke and the, the, my game 100%. But what I'm telling you guys today is there's been a lot of pros up here, and they've been talking to you about a bunch of different things. Take something that you have learned and use that, but do not, do not go back out into this life and pick up your old way of doing things because the old way is, man, I'm just going to watch pornography just one more time. I'm going to just have one more drink. I'm just going to call that girl just one more time. Don't do that, guys. We're leaving the old habits, the old swing, the old game behind. We're leaving today with a new game. Right? We've got a new stance, a new swing, and his name is Jesus Christ. And we're going to follow him, and we're going to do everything that he's told us to do. And we're going to get around like-minded men and learn from them. When my wife told me to stand up and be a man and to be a father and be the head of the house, I didn't know how to do that. Right? I learned from an alcoholic father how to be the head of a family. Right? I, did the exact, I told my family I will never... When I was a kid, I will never be like dad. I will never be like dad. And I was absolutely right. I was worse than my dad, right? But not knowing what to do puts that fear in us. And fear motivates us to do things that we normally won't do. Pornography, the drinking, the drugs, that's all fear-based. That's all fear-based. So, man, let's leave that fear behind and let's step out into freedom, all right? Um, Whew, man, man, man. You know, Bet was saying that women need security. How many guys have heard that? Women need security. And I thought the same thing. They got a roof over their head. She's got money in the bank. What are you not secure about? She wasn't secure that she didn't know where her husband was. She wasn't secure that we were staying married. She wasn't secure that, man, I was taking care of the family. She, she didn't know these things. And when a woman doesn't know that her husband is good, and that he's going to be honorable, and that he's going to be home tonight, and he's going to do the righteous things, and he's going to honor the, the sanctity of marriage and the covenant of marriage, women freak out, guys. They just freak out. They try to get things in order, and like Bet was saying, they become the head of the family, and they're put into a position that they were never designed for. So there, all these emotions and things are coming out. You want to see your wife become emotionally stable and be level-headed? Get deep with her. Start talking to her. Let her know how you feel. Man, I'm stressed at work. This, this corona thing, this virus, man, we've had, we've had friends and family who have died from it, you know, and we have. And we've got people calling us all the time, and we're helping people we're helping one person helping another. We have to help others. But you have to be able to speak about this to your wife. You've got to be able to talk about your feelings, right? That was the hardest thing for me to do. Like Bet was saying, he was crying after maximized manhood. There was times that, you know, I'm talking to my wife, and I'm just crying. I'm like, I don't know what's wrong with me. Because all these emotions that, were, that I had buried for so long were coming out. 
And just like, you know, they say, this is what they say, that a man is more connected to his wife after their, their sexual encounter, the man, that's when he opens up, and that's when, man, you can, she can ask for couches and stuff, and you get, like, we've got seven of them. Um, anybody need a couch? But a woman is more connected after an emotional talk, right? What sex from our wife does for us, emotionally talking to our wife does the same for them, right? God, do you see how God uses that to make us need and be dependent on each other to be dependent on him. We put him first over everything. We pray every day. We pray every day together. That was one thing we didn't do, right? And it was very uncomfortable because I'd be praying, Lord, you're, I'm a mighty man of God. And the night before I was drunk and, you know, having cocaine and watching pornography and she caught me, you know, and so I'm praying. I could feel, you know, I thought, <laughs> and, and so I'm praying, Lord, you know, I know, I know Lord, and you're just going to make this right. And, and, and I kind of open my eye a little bit, and she's looking at me like with one eye and one eye closed, going like, you know, God knows you were doing that last night, right? And I go, I'm just trying. I'm trying, girl. I'm trying. And I learned that the problems that we were having in our life became our prayer life. That's the stuff that we started to pray about. We started to pray about our, not our children becoming the right kids, but, man, that the people around them, that, that they had, that not, that, that, no, I'm sorry, that the kids that were coming were not the right kids to be around them, but that our kids were the right kids to be around other kids. We started praying differently. We started praying over our finances. We started praying, and then when God says, hey, sow a seed, and we're like, Lord, you know, and I'm like, Satan, you're a liar, you know, because, <laughs> you know, when it comes to money, that was just one thing to me, my dad, once again, don't ever give your money to a preacher. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't make offerings. How can I give to my wife freely and I can't even give to God, right? So that was tied to our tithe. You know, my wife used to say that, you know, Richard used to tip God, and I would. You know, she would give 10%, and I'd give God a tip, you know, and that's just the way it was for the longest time. And then her business, you know, started to skyrocket, and I'm like, man, we got to do this tithing thing. And then all of a sudden, my business started to take off. And I'm like, girl, we're on to something. I said, 20% this week. Give 20%. And she's like, oh, my gosh. She goes, it's working. You're falling in love with Jesus. I said, that's right, baby. Double down on Jesus. You know, <laughs> these are better odds in Vegas, right? But this was very on early in my walk. And I didn't know. But, man, I'm watching everybody else tithe. I'm watching everybody else give. And it seems like they're happy, and they're getting by, and they're never without. You know, we struggled with money our whole entire life. My whole entire life I've struggled with money until we started tithing. It changed my life, you know, changed our saving habits, changed the jobs that we got, changed the people God put in our life. You know, I'm just asking you guys, if you've never tithed, if you've never made an offering, do that. Tithe to your local church. Make an offering. Help people, right? And um, these are just things that we do on a daily basis. Um, anger leads to resentment, and resentment leads to retaliation. Retaliation leads to isolation. How many of us have ever felt that, right? There's times that, man, my wife and I, even to this day, you know, I'm not up here saying that we're perfect because we're not. There's times she'll do something, and oh, my gosh, it, I get so resentful, and then I'll say something. You know, it always, usually back in the day, it was, I'm going to go watch pornography. I'm going to go do a line. I'm going to go drink. She doesn't know that retaliation. You know, you just think you're getting even, but it's retaliation. And then all of a sudden, in that retaliation, you're isolated. You're by yourself. And that's right where the enemy wants you, right? Because what does the Word of God say? One will put to flight 1,000, but two will put to flight 10,000. That tells me that with my wife, I'm 10 times stronger. When we agree upon something, we're 10 times stronger, right? And now we're moving in the power of the Holy Spirit, right? She's got all the, the means and, and ways to make it on her own. She doesn't need me. I could do the same thing. But together, we're powerful. Together, we cannot be stopped. Because, man, with us, it's a trifold cord. Me, her, and God, and get out of our way, you know? I used to not feel like that. There was a time, about seven years, you know, bet when you were talking about you know, us being obedient and, and telling you that, hey, man, this is what God told me that you need to be in Dallas. You know, I don't know why. You know, he, was, he, he wanted to come and be a part of our marriage ministry. And I'm like, 
do you see it? Bet and Stephanie, they're just, they're on fire. I, you know, don't run, remember. Uh, they're hot. We need them. And, but, man, God just said, no, he needs to be in Dallas. And I just said it, you know. But it wasn't four years before that that Sherry and I would have got divorced. We were that close to getting divorced. If we would have got divorced, we'd have never met you. We'd have never had that conversation. This might not even be happening. Pastor Juan, I meet Pastor Juan. He calls us. We go do a radio show. We meet Pastor Beto. All of this is God's orchestration, guys. I meet Pastor Mike, right? And I'm talking to him, and he, he's all like, oh, and Steve, and Steve this, and we're going to meet with Steve. And I'm like, Steve, who? He goes, Steve Austin. I said, Steve Austin's my best friend. You know, God has orchestrated all of this, guys. This is not a surprise to him. He's not caught off guard. He's ready to do something different in your life, right? We need to learn how to process anger, right? Anger comes from frustration, right? And how do we do that? We have to talk to our spouses. And if it's something that you've never done, try it. She's going to freak out. She's going to love it. Women love to talk. If you haven't noticed that, they love to talk. And now you can't shut me up because when I'm with my wife, I want to talk. I want her to be able to open up to me and to share with me. And I never want to make her pay a price for being honest with me. I never want to make her hurt because she's made a mistake and make her feel bad about it. I want to be, I want her to see Jesus in me before she sees Richard. You follow me? And how many of you guys are, are, are married by a show of hands? How many of y'all married? Okay, keep your hands up. If you've been married five years or less, five years or less, keep your hands up. Okay, there's good news. There's good news for y'all. There's a time that we stop living as me, and we will start to live as we. Isn't that great? Average is 9 to 14 years. See, that never gets a round of applause. There you go. But see, we don't know these things. Hosea 4, 6 says, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. Right? We don't know these things. We think life is supposed to be fun. And, man, when you get married, we're done, girl. That's it. All right? The natural progression in marriage is to get worse. If you do nothing at all in your marriage other than go on love, the natural progression of your marriage is to fail. Isn't that crazy? We have to be intentional in our marriage. That's why, you know, people say, oh, this coronavirus, it's been a blessing. It's hard for me to get up here and say this virus and all the stuff that's happening in the world right now. God has blessed us anyways. Even in the midst of the valley, God has blessed us. Right? We were able to write a book. There it is right there. Really, your marriage can get better. Two tips going from tipping to giving and, and receiving to giving, right? Uh, or taking to receiving. And it's out there right now. It's $10 a piece or two for 30. My wife said, don't worry about it, baby. Just bring me the money and I'll figure it out. Actually, it's two for 15, ten, uh, $10 for each. But it, it's a really good book. We wrote it with a friend of ours, Joel Mom. We prayed for more time. God gave us more time. So, guys, I'm just asking you right now, improve your swing. Let Jesus help you make the right stance, make the right choices, pick the right friends, and you guys can do this. Amen? All right.